Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's National House campaign call. Uh, we will give it a minute before we get started to give folks a little bit of time to log in. Be right back at you. People are still logging in, so we're going to give it one more, well, 30 seconds more for uh, more folks to be able to join us, and then we'll get started. Okay, again, welcome uh, everyone to today's National House Campaign Call for Universal Stable Affordable Housing. Uh, my name is Paul Keeley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We have a, a great call uh, scheduled for you today. We'll, of course, discuss the latest developments on the Build Back Better Act and its historic affordable housing investments and the ongoing advocacy needed. Uh, before we do that, however, uh, Deborah Throop from the National Housing Law Project will join us to inform you about a letter uh, sent by NLI NLIHC and the National Housing Law Project and others to HUD about preventing evictions. We'll also hear from Sarah Robbins from the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness to talk about ensuring people receive their stimulus payments. We will uh, also share news about a new NLIC report on emergency rental assistance spending and performance trends as part of uh, the coalition's end rental arrears to stop evictions erase project. We'll receive updates from the field and, and much more. So um, we're gonna get started now. I just do wanna encourage you, if you have a question for a speaker or a panelist, please enter those into the Q&A box. I will mainly focus on the Q&A box for questions for our speakers and panelists. Of course, you can use the chat function as well to you know, share uh, with other participants on the call, but I'll principally focus on the Q&A box for questions for our, our panelists and presenters. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started now and I will turn it over to Deborah Throop from the National Housing Law Project to talk about our letter to HUD on preventing evictions. Deborah? Great, Paul, thanks so much. Um, so again, my name is Deborah Throop and I'm the Deputy Director of the National Housing Law Project. Um, so uh, thanks to Paul and everyone at the coalition for inviting me today to talk about a letter that NHLP and the coalition and about 50 other organizations um, signed on to last week and sent to HUD and many of your organizations, many of you are on the call. So thank you very much for signing on. Um, so we sent this letter to HUD, uh, basically requesting that HUD do more to stop evictions of its own residents. Um, and you know, while we've been making this request to HUD for the entirety of the pandemic, um, we sent a renewed request, and this particular letter was really in response to um, a few events. So the first one was that HUD published an interim final rule that went into effect last Monday. And this interim final rule is a rule that applies to the public housing and all of the project-based rental assistance programs. And what it does is require housing providers to give 30 days notice to tenants um, prior to eviction or termination. And it also requires that those housing providers include information in the notice about emergency rental assistance that's available in the, their local community. 
So while the goal of the notice is to really um, provide tenants with time and resources to seek emergency rental assistance, which we know there's um, still a lot of assistance available in many communities, um, and really prevent evictions for non-payment of rent for those tenants in the public housing and project-based rental assistance programs. Uh, the reality for most tenants is that 30 days notice is really not going to be sufficient to allow them to, to apply for and then receive um, the assistance and avoid the eviction. And of course, educating tenants is also really important um, about the availability of the assistance. But um, in order to um, really avoid those evictions, it's important to encourage landlords to cooperate um, with tenants and with the rental assistance programs as well. Um, so for all those reasons, we urged HUD in the letter to really take additional steps and go beyond the notice to protect its own residents from evictions. And we made a number of recommendations in the letter um, to, you know, that, that such, a, for example, requiring HUD landlords again to cooperate um, with rental assistance program applications. Um, and paperwork, um, and then, you know, even requiring HUD landlords to apply for the assistance itself where it's available prior to eviction or termination. Um, and so, the, and the other thing that the letter really responds to is something that we continue to hear from HUD, which is that HUD tenants aren't being evicted. Um, and, you know, so our letter for that reason really highlighted evictions from around the country that were happening in both public housing and PBR, you know, uh, project-based rental assistance properties. Um, we thought it was really important to elevate these tenant stories to HUD because, you know, we, we have a network of over 1,600 legal services attorneys, but also other housing advocates in the field, and we um, continue to hear, unfortunately, about evictions from, from HUD housing. Um, so this, the name of the interim final rule, just so you all have it, is the extension of time and required disclosures for notification of non-payment of rent. Um, it also went through a formal rulemaking process. We submitted formal comments as well that were much more um, in detail than the letter from the coalition and, again, many of your organizations. Um, so the, I, this interim final rule became effective uh, last week. It becomes effective after a presidential declaration of a natural emergency like COVID-19. And when the secretary determines that there's a need for more time for tenants to access any federal assistance. Um, and HUD did publish that determination um, in prior notice um, a few weeks back. Um, so one additional reminder, and we talk about this in our letter to HUD as well, is just the, the notice itself applies to public housing and project-based rental assistance tenants, um, but it's a really important reminder that the CARES Act Section 4024C requires 30-day notice of other HUD tenants. So, so for example, Section 8 voucher tenants um, also would be entitled to that 30-day notice. Um, so that's a summary of the letter itself. Um, happy to answer questions. Unfortunately, I do have to leave the call early. So if people have questions um, they don't have a chance to ask, please, my email is on the slide um, so you can reach out anytime. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah, for that information and for leading uh, this, this effort. Uh, we're so happy to be able to partner uh, with you on it. Um, I will just thank uh, Elena Calabria, who, uh, who posted both HUD's interim final rule and a copy of the letter. So there's links to those. I know that Deborah's got to run. Uh, you do have her email there. If you'd like to reach out to her, you can. Uh, but I uh, don't have any questions in here right now for you, Deborah. So thank you so much for uh, giving us that update. Sure. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, we will uh, now move on to our uh, next presenter, and that is um, uh, Sarah Robbins from the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness, who will uh, talk a little bit about uh, ensuring people receive their stimulus checks. So, Sarah, are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry, my camera was going on and off. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Sarah Robbins, um, I am with the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness, um, and our organization, um, we mobilize community to challenge systemic causes of homelessness um, and advocate for housing justice. Um, and around that, we do some work around public benefits, um, and we have been working on helping people that are homeless 
um, get stimulus payments um, over the last year. Um, and one of the issues that we were um, primarily involved in around um, people that are homeless getting stimulus payments is what we found, we had a lot of people who were um, filing um, and applying for the stimulus payments um, and were not receiving the checks. Um, and these were primarily people that were using um, the using addresses where lots of people get mail. So we have um, beyond general delivery, we have a lot of social service agencies where homeless um, individuals can receive their mail. We also have a community service office that has a mail service um, specifically for people um, that don't have another place to receive mail. Um, and so what we were finding is that we had literally like hundreds and hundreds of people that were not getting their mail. So we reached out um, with the help of our, um, one of our representatives here, um, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal's office. Um, we reached out to the Treasury, to Department of Treasury and the IRS to figure out what was going on. What we found out is that a lot of our um, places where people get mail got flagged as potential fraud because so many stimulus checks were being mailed there. So we worked with the Department of Treasury to essentially get all of those addresses unflagged. Um, and our community, when that happened, thousands of people received reissued checks um, that had all been uh, returned to sender. Um, so in that, we have been um, working with Department of Treasury um, and learned that um, the non-filer portal, which is the um, getctc.org, this is it's also the um, site where folks can sign up to get the child tax credit as a monthly benefit, um, that that portal is closing today. So today is the last day for folks to file for stimulus payments using that um, non-filer portal. So for the last couple of weeks here in King County, we have been doing, um, we did a training for social service providers, direct service providers, working with folks that are unhoused. Um, we've distributed flyers. We've just done a, a big push over these last two weeks um, to try and get as many people um, applying through that non-filer um, portal. Um, thanks for putting that in the chat. Um, and we've developed um, some outreach materials and um, and we recorded our training. I'm, I will put a link to that um, in the chat as well. Um, but really just trying to get the word out to um, as many people as possible um, that today is the deadline for that non-filer portal. Uh, people can claim the EIP payments, stimulus payments um, pass today, but they will have to wait until tax um, filing season opens in 2022, and they will have to file um, 2020 taxes to get EIP number one and number two, and they'll have to file 2021 taxes um, to get EIP number three. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions here or um, in the Q&A or chat box. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing this. Uh, it's so late in the game. And uh, obviously the work that you did was just um, so incredibly important getting you know, thousands of reissued checks. Uh, and I'm just imagining how uh, many people have not gotten their checks because they're, you know, they didn't have a nonprofit advocate in their in their community doing what you all did. Um, this is such important information. Uh, unfortunately, you know, today is the last day, but we really appreciate you sharing that. Um, it, somebody just said, uh, please repeat where residents go to ensure receipt of checks. If you yeah, want to so clarify that again. Yeah, the non-filer um, tax portal, which is getctc, 
org, um, and the link is in the um, chat. And um, Joseph uh, put in the chat a question, how much money does this mean for individuals? So depending on whether they've received any of the checks, so the first check was 1200, the second check was 600, and the third check was 1400, I believe. Great. So a fair amount of money. Yeah. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. If you could just hang out a little bit and just kind of keep your eye on the on the chat and the Q&A, see if anything else comes in, that would be great. Happy to. Really appreciate you sharing with us today. Thanks. All right, very good. We will move on to the next item on our agenda, and that is with Sarah Sadian, the VP for Public Policy at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, to talk about where we are with Build Back Better. Thank you, Sarah. All right, thank you so much. The saga continues with the bill. Congressional leaders are working to hold a vote as soon as this week on the Build Back Better Act uh, in the House. The bill includes, just as a reminder to folks, um, $154 billion in housing investments, including the top priorities that all of us have been working towards, which is $25 billion for ex to expand rental assistance to another 300,000 households, $65 billion, billion to preserve public housing for the two and a half million residents who live there, and $15 billion through the National Housing Trust Fund to build about 150,000 homes for people with the lowest incomes. So the bill is still moving uh, through the different chambers, but I will say that the fate of the bill is a little unclear. Earlier this month, we saw an attempt by Speaker Pelosi to bring the bill up for a vote on the floor, but she was forced to take the bill back after um, a handful of centrist Democrats threatened to vote against the measure. Those moderates, in turn, promised to uh, congressional leaders, they promised progressives that they would vote on the bill this week once they receive enough information about what the cost of the bill would be from the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO says that they will be able to release their estimate for the entire bill by the end of the day on Friday. I think this means you could see a vote late in the week, maybe Thursday, maybe Friday, maybe, maybe even over the weekend. Um, uh, and I know that Pelosi and progressives are really pushing hard, but it's difficult to know whether or not those centrist Democrats are gonna make good on their promise and actually vote in favor of the bill. That's why it's really important that advocates focus this week on calling their members of Congress, particularly those in, who are in the House, uh, and to urge them to quickly enact the Build Back Better Act, including the housing resources that are in the bill. Um, I'll also say we can share with you a link to some of who we think are the top priorities for folks to reach out to. I mentioned before that there were a handful of centrist Democrats. We have a list of those um, that we can share, but I just wanna call a couple of them out. So these are either those moderates who promised to vote on the bill this week or who threatened to vote against the bill but didn't promise to vote for the bill this week. So they're, they're undecided and we need every single one of them to vote for the bill. So that includes uh, Carolyn Bordeaux from Georgia, Ed Case from Hawaii, Jared Golden from Maine, Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey, Stephanie Murphy from Florida, Scott Peters from California, Kathleen Rice from New York, Kurt Schrader from Oregon, and Abigail Spanberger from Virginia. I think uh, my colleague shared in the chat box a list of our top priority uh, um, targets there. Check that out. If you have limited time, I encourage you to focus on those who are either the blue dogs or um, a part of the problem solvers caucus. Those tend to be some of the more conservative members of the Democrats. We need to make sure that they follow through on their promise to vote for this bill uh, and that we see a vote that passes uh, in the House. But I will say that we, while we expect the bill to move forward in the House this week, or at least that's what we're hoping for, we're still going to see delays on the Senate side because negotiations are continuing with Senator Manchin and Cinema. 
Those senators have not agreed publicly to a top line number that they're willing to support. We know that they're continuing to negotiate over specific pieces of the bill, not the housing pieces, but the other pieces. And so we think this process is gonna take a bit longer. At this point, you know, some Democrats have said that they wanna get it done by the end of the year, which really means like right before the Christmas recess. Um, so, so we're in store for a couple more weeks of this sort of advocacy that we need to keep up. I will say that the longer that this gets pushed back, the further into December we see it go past, even if we were to see it to go into 2022, let's hope that's not the case, the harder it's gonna be to keep all these Democrats on the same page and the more likely it is that we might see even further cuts to the bill. You know, we all talked about how it went from three and a half trillion to $1.75 trillion. It's possible we could see that go down further the longer this stays out there in the ether. One thing that I'm paying close attention to is the recent news about inflation being uh, longer than anticipated and higher than anticipated. That's a major concern for Senator Manchin. He said that in the past. I am worried and uh, very closely monitoring to see if Senator Manchin is gonna use that as leverage to demand even further cuts to the overall package. So it's something to be aware of. Um, we also will see if this gets pushed back further. It looks very likely that the Senate won't take this up till December. If that's the case, that means that Congress is gonna have a very busy December where they have to finalize Build Back Better, they have to pass final spending bills for FY22 or pass another continuing resolution, they're gonna to have to deal with the debt ceiling, they're gonna to have to pass a lot, uh, some other must pass legislation, the list goes on, but all of that means that it becomes um, tighter and tighter and more difficult to find the, the, the time um, to pass the bill. So because of all those outstanding issues, you know, we know that there are going to be changes when it goes to the Senate side. It's incredibly important for advocates to continue engaging with their members of Congress uh, between now and the end of the year when it looks like this bill might cross the finish line. It's really important for you to be continuing to explain to members of Congress about why these housing investments and rental assistance, public housing and the housing trust fund are so important and what they mean for you and your community. Um, to help you do that work, we've created some resources that you can use. I wanna share, or I'll ask Elena to share a link to some in-district uh, tips that we've put together. Um, Congress is gonna be home uh, on recess the week of Thanksgiving, so next week. They'll also be on recess some of December. That's a really good time for you to be engaging with your member of Congress when they're home. You can go to town hall meetings, you can schedule meetings with them or with their staff. Um, so I wanna share, I'll share a link uh, in the chat box to that resource that you can all use. But I think the important thing here is that we've come so far in securing really robust resources that are targeted to people with the greatest needs. We still have a lot of work ahead of us and we really need folks to be engaged in, in keeping the pressure on Congress to act quickly to enact the bill. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Paul. Okay, we'll stay on though, Sarah, because there are a few questions here. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, Mark Smith says, um, asked the question, are there any elements of the Tax Credit Improvement Act in the Build Back Better Act as it stands now? Yes, there are. And I can share, or I can ask uh, Elena to share our fact sheet on the housing resources that are in the bill. There are a number of uh, tax credit provisions, including an expansion of the low income housing tax credit by 41% phased in over a, a number of years. There is a fix to the 50% bond test for five years, I believe. And there's also some permanent expanded basis boosts for extremely low income developments and tribal housing developments. I'll, um, in that document, you can see more, um, some more details on that. But yes, that's a part of the overall package in addition to $154 billion in direct spending uh, that's in the bill. 
Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna do a two-part question from Jerry, uh, who asks, how might we gain access to the CDO scoring? I know it's coming out in dribs and drabs so far, and then hopefully we'll see the full thing on Friday. Um, but he also asks, uh, will Janet Yellen and the economic team weigh in about the inflation risks and deflation benefits? So yeah, the CBO score I think will be made public. So we should be able to see that. I have, um, I think the bigger question here or the, or the biggest question um, is about inflation. I, yeah, Janet Yellen will weigh in. She already has weighed in. She'll, I'm sure the White House will continue to do that. The second piece that the CBO score will tell us is how much this bill raises versus how much it costs. From everything we've heard, more money is raised than is spent in the bill. And so there might actually be resources that could be used for deficit reduction. That would be a really powerful argument to share with members of Congress if that turns out to be the case that the CBO says. Um, but something that I worry about is, is that Republicans have been um, reframing the conversation about the CBO score and about the cost of the bill. Right now, the CBO scores the bill as written. Uh, which includes a lot of changes that have been made over the last several months to shorten the period of time that assistance is provided. So for example, the child tax credit was, was um, um, sized down, so it's only in place for a number of years rather than the full 10 years that would be allowed under a budget reconciliation bill. Republicans are having saying, well, that's not a true cost of the bill. We have to look at what it would be if every program was funded at the full 10 years and even beyond. And so there's gonna be a lot of pressure regardless of what the CBO score actually says. There'll be a lot of pressure on those moderate and centrist Democrats um, uh, to, for, to frame the bill as being too expensive. So it's really important that folks are weighing in with their members of Congress, explaining why these resources are really needed and why we need to make the investment. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so it could, Elena, if you wouldn't mind putting in the, the targets again, because uh, Paula Hudson asked if we can get a list of the, the Dems who are undecided, and that's really the, the targets you shared before, and if you could just share that again, that'd be helpful. Um, we did have a question from Linda Seltzer, just maybe if you could just repeat, Sarah, you know, the number, the, the dollar number that's in the bill for housing choice vouchers, um, and you know, maybe a little bit more detail on that in terms of the number of, of well, you can share again, the number of households that's expected to, to support and, and, um, and also maybe a little bit more detail about that there's also some project-based rental assistance in there and, and how the vouchers will be divvied out uh, some for people experiencing homelessness and so forth. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I'll ask Elena to share our fact sheet one more time also in the chat box. So the bill provides $154 billion overall for housing investments. That includes $25 billion for rental assistance. Uh, $22.1 billion of that is for housing choice vouchers, which we and our partners at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities estimate would serve 300,000 households. Another $1 billion is provided for project-based rental assistance. And there are some additional resources for mobility counseling, landlord incentives, and tenant protection vouchers as well. Of the overall resources provided for housing choice vouchers, all of those, those dollars are targeted to extremely low income households who we know are most at risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability. But there's also $7.1 billion set aside specifically for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness survivors of domestic violence and uh, victims of trafficking. So there's some really targeted important resources that are in the bill there. I'll also share, um, I mentioned earlier that um, there are really amazing resources for the Housing Trust Fund and for public housing, but I do wanna just point out that the resources in for rental assistance in this bill would provide the largest increase to the program since it was created it is a huge increase, one that we really can't receive, you know, we can't really get those sorts of numbers when it comes to the regular spending bills that Congress takes up every year. This is really our best and really our only opportunity to um, get 
a really significant increase in the number of uh, vouchers that are available for folks. So it's important that we're using this opportunity, that Congress is using this opportunity to invest at the scale that's needed. I'll also say that the investment in um, public housing and the housing trust fund are also very historic. The housing trust fund typically is funded at less than a billion dollars a year. So this is you know, 15 times the amount of an investment that we've seen through that program. So a very historic level. For public housing, the $65 billion that's provided would almost entirely address the, the estimated backlog for capital needs for, for those homes. Um, and it can go a long way towards preserving that asset for future generations. So all of the investments that are in the bill are incredibly important, uh, but that's not just me saying it. <laughs> we need to be saying that to our members of Congress and explaining them to them why these resources are so important to us and why they really shouldn't be delaying a vote on the Build Back Better Act. Great, thank you, Sarah. I will just say that um, Mark Smith just asked, uh, please don't forget to put a link to the tax credit elements that are in the Build Back Better Act. Thank you. And I know, you know, we've put the and those overview. Are, yeah, yeah, they're in our fact sheet. So you should be able Correct. to find more details there. Great. Uh, I was just going to mention that. And then um, there's a, an, another question here that I think we can answer, which is how can we determine the allocations at the local level per state? Will there be formulas after the bill is passed so localities can know how much to expect for housing choice vouchers, et cetera? So in our fact sheet, you'll also see a link to a resource that was created from our partners at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities that estimates how many vouchers each state would receive. So that's a good resource for you to use. We've done something similar when it comes to the Housing Trust Fund. It's also linked to in our fact sheet that Elena shared uh, so to show you how much money from the Housing Trust Fund your state would get if it's funded at $15 billion. The public housing dollars are a little bit more tricky to figure out. Most of those dollars are provided to the secretary, to the HUD secretary to use to prioritize public housing that's in need. There, it's going outside of the regular formula, which means it's really hard to predict exactly how those dollars are gonna flow. Um, so we have those resources on a couple of the programs, but not all of them. Okay, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna have you answer the next one because I think the, the answer is a very emphatic yes, but I do wanna share it because I think it's important for, uh, for everybody to, to know this. And, uh, Jordan Maria Everett says uh, she works at a small public policy organization, the Center for Civic and Public Policy Improvement in Houston. Would you suggest our following slash readers? Um, she writes a weekly policy brief with calls to action. Be directed to engage in advocacy with those Democrats you listed in, in addition to their local members of Congress. The answer is absolutely yes. Please, everything you can do in the next, uh, really today, tomorrow, uh, to encourage readers to contact their members of Congress in support of uh, the Build Back Better Act with the current uh, really historic investments in affordable housing. There are a few other things, uh, questions that have come in or comments, uh, but I think we'll move on to the agenda. And Sarah, if, if you or one of the team wants to address some of those, uh, that'd be great. Thank you very great. much. Thanks Sarah. so much. Talk to you guys soon. Okay, we will move on in our agenda um, and we'll be turning it over now to two NLIHC staff, Emma Foley and Sophie Sabak glover who will talk about a new report that NLIHC published last week on emergency rental assistance spending and performance trends. So Emma, we'll turn it over to you. I'm gonna kick it off and then I'll pass it off to Emma. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Nine months has passed since the U.S. Department of the Treasury first allocated the $25 billion in ERA-1 funds to state and local governments, and this report recently published describes the process for reallocation, provides an overview of ERA spending progress and grantees at risk of reallocation, and offers recommendations to ERA administrators and Treasury to best serve low-income renters. Next slide. To better understand the nuances of spending progress and trends, there are three important points to consider regarding the initial allocation of ERA-1 funds. 
First, Treasury determined each state's maximum share of ERA-1 funds based on their share of the total U.S. population, with a small state minimum of $200 million. This minimum allocation provided a greater per capita allocation to small states. For example, New York's population is nearly 33 times Wyoming's population, yet New York received less than seven times the amount of ERA-1 than Wyoming. Second, local jurisdictions received only 45% of their population's share of their state funding. Because of this cap, states also received a, a, relative, a greater relative per capita allocation compared to their cities and counties. Although this disproportionality was mitigated by states that subgranted a portion of their funding to local grantees. Lastly, research by the NYU Furman Center, Housing Initiative at Penn and NLIHC estimates that within New York State, three quarters of the need for rental assistance was concentrated in New York City, yet the city only received 19% of the state's total funding. This research found that the initial allocation formula particularly disadvantaged renters of color as 74% and 80% of the state's Black and Latino-headed renter households reside in New York City. Next slide. The initial allocation formula is important to consider when thinking about the reallocation process. Broadly, Treasury is using two steps to determine if a grantee's funds will be reallocated. The first step is based on how much a grantee has obligated of their ERA-1 funds. Programs which have certified that they've obligated over 65% of their ERA-1 allocation by today will have no funds deemed excess. If a program has not met the 65% obligation threshold, they will need to submit a program improvement plan and a progress report. Next slide. For those under the 65% obligation threshold, the second step to determine excess funds is through the expenditure ratio. The expenditure ratio is the amount grantees have distributed divided by 90% of their total allocation. Grantees which have an expenditure ratio above 30% will have no funds deemed excess if they submit the required program improvement plan and progress report. If a grantee does not submit those two documents, 10% of their initial allocation will be deemed excess. Grantees below the 30% threshold who submit a program improvement plan will only need to meet a 15% threshold. Grantees who do not submit a program improvement plan will have the difference between the 30% expenditure threshold and their actual expenditure ratio uh, deemed excess funds. Next slide. The expenditure ratio that grantees must meet to avoid recapture will increase by 5% each month and be assessed by Treasury every two months. Any funds not obligated by March 31st, 2022 will be deemed excess funds and subject to potential recapture. For more details regarding the reallocation process, feel free to check out our fact sheet, which is linked in the slide and which I will drop into the chat. I'll now pass it to Emma to discuss the brief findings and recommendations. Thanks, Sophie. The analysis in this report uh, it uses publicly available data on grantee spending and households served published from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. And the data used is current as of the end of September. Overall, we found that 40% of the $25 billion in ERA-1 funds was dispersed as of the end of September. Spending across grantees continues to be uneven, though, with 28% of grantees spending less than 30% of their ERA-1 allocation and 20% of grantees spending more than 80%. The spending data indicates that Treasury could potentially recapture and reallocate a total of $1.2 billion from grantees that did not reach the required expenditure ratio. This amount decreases to $257 million, however, if all grantees submit an approved performance improvement plan, which is due today. Next slide. In addition to spending progress, we compared the share of households assisted by ERA-1 for state and local grantees within a single state. We paired this data uh, with the proportion of funding received by state and local grantees. 
In Alabama, for example, we found that the state grantee received 81% of the state's total ERA-1 allocation, but served only 38% of households that were provided ERA-1 assistance. Alabama's local grantees received 19% of the state's ERA-1 allocation, but account for 62% of the households served in the state. This relationship is reversed in New Jersey, where the state grantee has served 78% of assisted households, but only received 60% of the state's total funding. These data may inform reallocation as local or state programs that have served a disproportionate number of renters in their state may be in the best position to administer additional funds if funds are reallocated. Next slide. The report also examined the proportion of potentially eligible renters in need that have received ERA within a state. Uh, we conducted this analysis to assess grantee reach and potential need for additional funds. We used the number of low income cost burden renter households in a state as a proxy for the number of potentially eligible ERA households. Figure six in this slide shows the percent of the total allocation for all grantees within a state that has been spent and the number of households served as a proportion of cost burden low income households within the state. And this, is, uh, this graph just shows uh, this relationship for select states. More than 60% of ERA-1 funding has been spent in states like New York, New Jersey, and Virginia, yet the number of households served represents 15% or less of all low income cost burden renters within those states. Alternatively, states that received the small state minimum and have spent their funding quickly have served much higher proportions of cost burden low income renters, including Alaska and the District of Columbia. This data indicates that in states with large low income renter populations, the need for ERA may be far greater than the amount of actual assistance available. Next slide. Reallocation is an opportunity for Treasury and ERA program administrators to address uneven emergency rental assistance performance, ensure access uh, to ERA for low-income renters, and correct for the initial disproportional ERA allocation. Given these findings, the report offers three guiding principles to inform and guide the recapture and reallocation process. One, Reallocate funds to grantees that are utilizing best practices and quickly getting assistance to households in need. Two, reallocate funds to jurisdictions with high levels of need by considering the number of low income renters and people experiencing homelessness within a jurisdiction, populations that are disproportionately people of color. And three, ensure renters across all jurisdictions maintain access to ERA. Next slide. The report also offers specific recommendations related to four areas, program improvement, within state fund redistribution, out of state fund redistribution, and data transparency for future research and evaluation. For example, when reallocating funds within a state, low spending state grantees should reallocate a portion of funds to high spending local grantees with continuing need. Local grantees already implementing ERA are well positioned to administer this funding as they likely have connections to community-based organizations and specific knowledge of local needs. When redistributing funds out of state, Treasury should prioritize sending funds to states and jurisdictions that receive disproportionately low ERA-1 allocations and have large low-income renter populations. This research brief focuses on grantee spending of ERA-1 funds given the upcoming reallocation process. Future analysis, though, should focus on additional metrics to better understand the extent to which the ERA program is serving those with the greatest need. Next slide. And lastly, if you have any questions about this report or the methodology, do feel free to reach out to me at efoley at nlihc.org. Thank you very much, Emma and Sophie, for that uh, report description. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, see if you have uh, some thoughts about them. Um, <clears throat> one <clears throat> was, um, are you aware of how landlords and housing owners are changing their behaviors to the detriment of low and moderate income households because of faults in the administration of these ERA programs, part one, and part two, um, are, is there mo any movement towards a push for landlords to actually accept these funds? 
those are two different people, but they're both about landlords. So I thought I'd kind of put them together and see if you have any thoughts on those. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about landlords changing their behavior because of faults with the ERA program specifically, but we've certainly seen research around landlord behavior during COVID-19, which I can link in the chat, um, that indicates that landlords have uh, have engaged in numerous processes to uh, that they maybe didn't before COVID-19. Some of some of this is positive things like forgiving rent or coming up with a payment plan, whereas others are things like deferring maintenance or increasing fees. Um, and related to a push to get landlords to accept these funds, um, you know, we've seen more and more encouragement from the Department of Treasury to ensure that uh, uh, to ensure that programs are providing an option to provide payments directly to tenants. Um, so this might not increase the likelihood that landlords accept the funds, but ensures that much needed funds get to households that need it, even when landlords refuse. Um, and, and additionally, while this report only focuses on the ERA-1 funds, ERA-2 does require uh, that programs provide assistance directly to tenants when landlords refuse. So as more and more programs start utilizing those funds, we uh, can expect to see that transition. Great. Here's another question uh, from Penny uh, Raphaelson. Um, can you please clarify the difference between the March 31st deadline regarding unobligated funds will be considered excess and the September 30th deadline of all ERA-1 funds must be obligated? Does this, does this mean that funds that are not obligated may be recaptured? And if they are not, they will, be, they will need to be obligated by September. Sure. So um, statutorily, uh, funds need to be obligated by September 2022. And so in the reallocation process, Treasury will assume that uh, may assume that any unobligated funds by March 2022 will are excess so that they can reallocate those funds to different grantees and they will have time to spend down those funds by September 2022. Great. A uh, couple of other questions. Oregon has announced that state funds are about to run out. There are a few other states in this category, I know. Um, so they're creating an application pause beginning December 1st. How soon can we expect reallocation funds to states? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, in addition to Oregon, you know, many other states just in the last couple of weeks have announced closing their portals. Uh, including New York to most cities and counties, as well as Texas, DC. Um, but in terms of reallocation, the the, fine, the due date for some of the last forms that will be used uh, for reallocation is today. And so starting after today, Treasury should have all the information they need to begin the reallocation process. And uh, they haven't given us an exact date of when that money might actually start moving around, but they have indicated that it should be uh, shortly after um, they receive that additional information that is due today. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks. The only thing that I'll add to that is that grantees who do need additional funds can um, submit a request for reallocated funds for this first tranche um, by November 30th. Um, and then there will be additional processes to ask for additionally reallocated funds is our understanding. You may have mentioned it, and if I missed it, I, I apologize. Um, but did you mention that there's also a process for voluntary uh, reallocation? Yeah, so um, there, there's a process for voluntary reallocation for uh, states or localities to redistribute their initial allocation within their state. Um, there's more details about that on the NLIHC fact sheet, which I can link again, um, or Elena, um, so, but there is a process that states can undergo and localities can undergo for voluntary reallocation. And then there are two related questions uh, that I'm, I'll kind of group together here. Is there any research out there on the rate of fraud occurring across state programs? This could help advocacy efforts with the state program administrator in uh, Alabama. And 
someone else asked also, is, is fraud a big issue? Uh, and will grantees be forced to return funds that were distributed to those who intentionally defrauded the process? Yeah, this is a question that we get a lot. And, you know, we mostly have heard about fraud or, or grantees not really experiencing fraud uh, anecdotally through interviews and meetings we have with administrators. Um, so that's to say, you know, we don't have a kind of a scope of how it's occurring across all grantees, but uh, generally in our conversation with administrators, particularly when we're asking about implementing additional flexibilities that um, administrators might be concerned about, like direct attendant assistance or self-attestation, we ask if they noticed an increase in fraud, you know, when they implemented these processes. And across the board, the answer has been no. Um, and so I think that, you know, if if there is apprehension about implementing flexibilities uh, in emergency rental assistance programs, we're happy to refer to administrators that have done so and haven't experienced an increase of fraud, um, but don't have a don't have a sense of how that's going across every single grantee. All right, very good. Again, thank you very much, Emma and Sophie, for that excellent presentation and for answering all of our questions. Really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on in our agenda, and uh, we will move into state up field updates. And we'll start with Reggie Black uh, from People for Fairness Coalition in D.C. Reggie? Yes, hello. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Thanks, Reggie. All righty. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on, on the situation here in the District of Columbia. My name is Reginald Black, pronouns he, him, his, and I'm the executive director of the People for Fairness Coalition. Um, just a little about myself. I've um, been homeless in the District of Columbia for a decade. Um, I you know, provide consistent testimony at the DC Council. Um, I'm part of and actually am participating right now as well um, in the uh, Continuum of Care Board, the Interagency Council on Homelessness for DC. And this has been for about nine plus years. Um, at People for Fairness Coalition, we provide direct services in the form of outreach and mentoring. And I'm passionate about ending homelessness in the District of Columbia. Um, I think there were some slides there so you could advance those, but um, we looked at when uh, uh, updating our, yeah, next slide please. We looked at um, um, in 2019 uh, to update our uh, strategic plan to end homelessness uh, for singles. There were 10,295 um, unique households. And of course noted here, youth were not even accounted uh, among those that needed services throughout a year. And that was substantially higher than our point in time count. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, this just shows our point in time count uh, for the District of Columbia, which was about uh, 5,111 individuals experiencing homelessness. Of those, there were uh, 681 unaccompanied adults in the District of Columbia. Um, and so um, in the uh, recent months, um, the last three months, starting in August, the District of Columbia um, has created a pilot program um, to try to expedite um, housing placements for unsheltered persons in select um, encampment areas in the city, um, while also the uh, National Park Service also um, has been closing down um, certain areas with encamp residents. This pilot program is being coupled um, with permanent closures here in the District of Columbia. And so we have a situation in which there are some unhoused uh, folks who are unsheltered who are being displaced currently, and we're actively working on that. Next slide, please. This is a um, <clears throat> this is a report um, that shows um, from our office of the chief financial officer that there are actually seventeen thousand six hundred and fourteen vacant rental units in the District of Columbia. Sixteen point one percent of those are Class A luxury units. So when we're talking about things like the demand and landlord behavior, this is a clear sign of how that's going down. And you can uh, uh, advance that slide there. 
um, to really show you what this looks like here. Um, and as you can see, this is our inventory as of um, October. So we at People for Fairness Coalition have been partnering with some great organizations, um, one in particular called Serve Your City DC, also um, it's Ward 6 uh, Mutual Aid Network as well as the Ward 2 Mutual Aid Network. Um, and we've been providing personal protective equipment for unhoused persons. Um, through our restroom initiative, we were able to help provide and uh, push the city to provide porta potties um, and hand washing stations. And so we provide the materials needed to use those effectively to include uh, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, um, and uh, uh, wipes for people to sanitize themselves. But like I said, over the course of the last few months, we've been witnessing the uh, continued uh, displacement of encampment residents all across the city. And so we um, here have been calling for our government to uncouple um, this pilot program from permanent closures of encampments for whatever reason, whether that's you know development, we want them to clearly define health and safety risks. Um, I don't know if people heard, but unfortunately there was a young man actually injured um, a couple of weeks ago um, during one of those encampment clearings. Um, we know that currently this is against CDC guidance, and we want to make sure that people, um, people's rights are protected and that um, our residents are able to access the many, many resources um, that, uh, that are in the District of Columbia. And we call on people to support our COVID-19 outreach and, and, and all of those different things. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that people you know, kind of understood what the situation here is in the nation's capital. Um, we are a right to shelter jurisdiction. Yes, we do spend more than just about every other jurisdiction in the nation on housing, but that's only like 3% of a $17 billion budget. So we need people to, um, you know, assist us in calling for more funding for housing, making sure that, you know, we provide leadership um, as how housing as a human right in the District of Columbia. And you can advance the next slide. If you wanna learn more about People for Fairness Coalition, here is our contact information, our website. You can go to uh, uh, www.pffcdc.org. Um, also, if you wanna go straight to our donate page to support our COVID outreach, we're gonna convene our um, eighth annual uh, longest night of the year, homeless memorial and overnight vigil. Um, you can support that as well. We, uh, we are working on anti-discrimination in which we support and are pushing for language within uh, a piece of legislation here locally called the Human Rights Enhancement Act. And we also have our um, public restroom initiative which calls for um, restrooms in the District of Columbia that are accessible to anyone 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and our main initiative is always pushing for universal housing rights through our universal right to housing campaign. And so you can go to our website, um, check out those different initiatives. You can donate if you wish. If you wanna contact us, you definitely can email our organization at info at pffcdc.org. And you can also email me directly at streetreporter227 at gmail.com. And with that, uh, I'm you know, happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, Reggie, uh, and thank you for all you're doing. Uh, there are a lot of comments <clears throat> along the lines of Reggie's the best. Yes, he is. Mr. Black, thank you for being the hope of our homeless population here in DC. Um, we've included DC folks can take action, a link there. And uh, we also had somebody put in a, um, a link to uh, the Oversight Roundtable uh, at which you you gave testimony. Um, I'm just looking through here. People want to stay in touch. Thank you, Reggie. That was amazing. So there's a lot there. Reggie, if you could just kind of take a look at uh, everything that came in the chat. If there's anything you want to respond to, feel, feel free. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Again, thank you for what you're yeah, doing, what you're doing, doing and, and uh, your presentation today. Yes. Uh, one other thing that People for Fairness Coalition is also pushing is something called the Vacant to Virus Reduction Plan. 
and I could actually put the link to that in the chat. Um, this calls for a uh, significant community effort um, to secure those 17,000 vacant units, most of them which one third of uh, across the entire city are these luxury units. And so hopefully through you know assistance from the national uh, the, the National Low Income Housing Co Coalition, whoops, wrong website. <laughs> um, we can also push our um, city government to make sure that they assist us with this community developed and led plan um, to make sure that we secure uh, those vacant units and are able to provide uh, a community based on mutual aid to make sure those residents um, have all the materials that they need to transition into permanent housing. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you again, Reggie. All right, we'll move on now to our next field update. And we have uh, Tron Wong uh, from Keep St. Paul Home and Eric Hauge from Homeline in uh, Minnesota. Hey everyone, thanks so much for having me. My name is Trom Wong. I use she her, her pronouns. And um, like Paul said, I'm the campaign manager for the Keep St. Paul Home campaign. And um, Eric and I are here today to share an update about what happened recently on election day in both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, as some of you know, we're right across the river from each other. So a lot of our um, housing work is regional. I was a campaign manager for the campaign that passed rent stabilization in St. Paul. And I will also provide a summary of the rent stabilization charter amendment that was passed in Minneapolis. Um, so I will start with St. Paul, um, since that's the campaign I was most involved in. Um, as some of you may know, on November 2nd, we passed a rent stabilization ordinance that was very specific in St. Paul. Um, we worked to get it on the ballot. We have to connect, collect over 9,000 signatures from registered voters in order to place the ordinance on the ballot. And then um, we, we ran a campaign. We ran a campaign once it got on the ballot. And on November 2nd, 53% um, of St. Paul voters voted to pass this rent stabilization ordinance, which is incredible given the um, the fight that we had to fight, you know, organizing folks in the middle of a pandemic, organizing folks when there was a lot of housing instability with um, folks experiencing unemployment and housing instability due to um, regulatory changes in our housing market. There was so much going on. And um, in addition to that, the opposition spent over $4 million just in our little twin cities to, to fight off a grassroots campaign. Um, to share a little bit more about the policy, the policy that we passed in St. Paul is the 3% annual cap on rent increases, um, meaning landlords won't be able to increase rent more than 3% in a 12 month period. Um, this policy applies to all units, um, regardless of you know, whether it's a single family home or a larger building, um, there's no exemption for new construction because we believe that everyone, whether they live in a new building or an old building should be protected from egregious rent hikes. And there is a process for landlords to request exemptions because we know that things happen, right? Sometimes you have a, a roof that you need to replace that you didn't anticipate for, or sometimes um, you'll get a new market evaluation and the property taxes might increase a lot and you might need to increase rent more than 3%. So there is an exceptions process the city will create. Um, the ordinance will not be in effect until May 1st of 2022. So there's going to be a six month implementation period for the city to figure that out. And um, and yeah, I think that's the, the details in the, in the ordinance. Um, the big part right now is for us to make sure as advocates that, um, that we're holding our elected officials accountable because Unlike other ordinances that are passed in the city of St. Paul, this was done via ballot initiative. And six out of the seven wards in St. Paul um, voted to pass, voted in support of rent stabilization, meaning theoretically we have six out of the seven council members who are going to be, you know, putting their 100% into implementing the exact policy that was passed. Um, already we're getting kind of, I think we're getting a sense that some council members want to build, uh, build in exemptions or change the way that the policy is crafted. And as advocates, we're saying, you know, give it a chance. We did a lot of work to put this together. We did a lot of research, talked to a lot of cities and, and 60,000 people voted on this. So we should give it a chance, make sure it's implemented the way the voters decided on it. 
and see what happens next. Um, in Minneapolis, there was also a um, there was also a rent stabilization issue on the ballot. It is slightly different. So in Minneapolis, they did not pass a rent stabilization ordinance because the city charter actually prevents um, people from putting something directly on the ballot. So whereas in St. Paul, we were able to put a very specific policy on the ballot. In Minneapolis, what folks were voting on was whether or not the city um, city council should have the ability or the power to create a rent stabilization policy. And luckily that passed as well. 53% of Minneapolis voters said that yes, city council should have the ability to create a rent stabilization ordinance, which means that city council now has the ability. Um, of course, that is that means that another battle is going to start, right? Because we're going to have to make sure that city council members in Minneapolis, of which there are 13, um, can all agree on a policy that renters and homeowners and landlords across the city um, want to see implemented, and that will be a long policy making process. So whereas in St. Paul, the first step was get it on the ballot. Step two is pass it on the ballot in Minneapolis. Step one is let city council do it. Step two, make city council do it. Um, so that's kind of the, the difference between the two cities. And um, there's probably a lot of questions um, about our campaign. I could talk for hours about it, but I wanna make sure that I answer what people are interested in hearing about. And also wanna give Eric a chance to speak if he'd like. Thanks, Tom. I don't. I don't really have anything else to add. Uh, the the campaigns that happened in in Minneapolis and St. Paul were were uh, super important um, and and successful um, and grassroots focused. And uh, I just put in the chat really quick. The reason why we had to do it this way in Minnesota is that there's the state statute uh, from the 1980s that effectively prohibited rent control. Um, there has been efforts at the state legislature to actually remove that subdivision to uh, the, the one exception to the rent control statute that allows cities uh, to enact their own local rent control um, ordinances. So that's, that's what uh, both Minneapolis and St. Paul were trying to do. What Trump talked about was uh, fit into this exemption in the state law. And that's why there's slightly different um, styles or, or approaches that, that each city had. But um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to add. Thanks a ton, Trump, for, for covering it. Outstanding. Um, so Jerry Pohe had the same question I had, which is, can you talk a little bit about your organizing strategy, partners, and opposition? Sure. Uh, that could be a whole webinar in itself, right? I'll, I'll try to pull out some highlights. Um, our coalition, so the name of the campaign was Keep St. Paul Home, um, as you can see by my yard sign back here. But um, our coalition was one that was formed around deep relationships. Um, it's called Housing Equity Now St. Paul. Um, and the website is where you can learn a little bit more about us and folks have put that in the chat. And so I think that one of the keys to success for us was build with organizations that you're already in relationship with because a campaign is a very stressful environment. And you wanna make sure that you can trust the people you're working with to, um, to hold the line to not compromise. And you have to know, you have to be very clear with one another about what the roles are, what people are willing to do, what people are not willing to do. Um, it's not a bad thing if people have boundaries, right? That's a very healthy thing. But the thing is that a lot of people don't discuss those boundaries before going into something as huge as a campaign. Um, our coalition members were very broad and I think that's what really helped. Um, our key members were grassroots organizations that had really strong bases in St. Paul, um, such as our neighborhood associations and district councils. You know, not all of them are supportive, but the ones that were a part of our coalition represented the most racially and economically diverse um, neighborhoods of St. Paul. So they're very much on the ground. Um, we also had legal and policy organizations such as Homeline, Housing Justice Center. Um, we also had big um, organizations that do a lot of base building like Isaiah and Take Action. So they have, you know, bases of hundreds, if not thousands of people who can be mobilized to go out to the ballot. And, and we had a variety of nonprofits and unions as well um, to help back us up with the organizing and kind of navigate the political environment necessary. Um, and let's see, I think 
a lot of our messaging was very much rooted in, um, how do I say this? It, it, it was as local as possible. We had, we uplifted the stories of people who lived in St. Paul and we had community leaders. If you saw our campaign lit, there was just warm, positive, we can take care of one another, you know, vibe about it. Um, and then the opposition, which raised over $4 million and that's unprecedented for, for the Twin Cities politics. Um, that's, yeah, it was just an unprecedented amount of money. Um, most of it came from out of state, the National Association of Realtors, National Apartment Association. Um, a lot of it came from LLCs in Minnesota and outside of Minnesota. We had a lot of national money pouring in. Um, and our campaign raised and spent around $300,000. So we were outspent 20 to one. And I think the strength of our coalition was really in, in organizing. Um, we had door knocks across the city. We had organizations that, you know, kind of captained various precincts or organizations that said, you know, these apartment buildings I'm going to take care of. We're going to make sure people are registered to vote. We're going to make sure they hear about what's on the ordinance, what's on the bat ballot. And then come November 2nd, we're going to make sure they come out to vote. So there's just a lot of work that has to be done to make sure that you know, it's not a one touch thing because getting people to go out to vote on an off year election can be difficult. Um, and our messaging was really grounded in, in this positive message of, you know, what can we do together? What we've been doing as a city to address our housing crisis has not worked and we have to try something new. This is an ordinance that has been passed in over 180 cities. Um, we can learn from the mistakes that other cities have made because a lot of times people hear rent control and they go, ah, you know. So we wanted to make sure that everyone who voted for the policy was grounded in research, grounded in facts, and also grounded in St. Paul, because we were hearing from a lot of people that did not live in our communities who did not see what renters were experiencing in terms of economic displacement, trying to tell us what we needed uh, and what our city really needed. And at the end of the day, you can't really trust the $4 million that come in from people who are trying to continue um, to protect their right to increase rents at whatever rate, um, to, you can't trust them to come up with solutions for BIPOC renters, for low wealth renters that are most deeply impacted by these issues. Um, so that's a lot of um, our strategy. It was, it was very much be on the ground, have conversations, make sure people are hearing not just from you know their elected leaders about why this is important, but from their neighbors, from you know, the executive director of the, the organization that they go to for social services, um, from the people that they rely on in community for the news. Like you have to make sure that people are hearing support from the, the messengers that they trust. Um, and that really helps combat the, the outside money and messaging that's pouring in. So, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think that's like a, a very high level overview. Great. Um, so for either of you, um, how did your campaign address concerns about rent, to, rent control, reducing rental housing production and contributing to rental housing scarcity? Yeah, I can, um, I can touch on that. Obviously, that was something that the opposition really leveraged to, to scare people into, um, to try to scare people into voting no. I think we've grounded it in a lot of research. So our partners at the University of Minnesota over at the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs did a very deep literature review and an analysis of our housing market in the Twin Cities um, to look at um, really like what the research says. And what the research says is that rent stabilization policies do not inhibit um, new construction. And, and so we are confident that the way that we set up our policy um, could avoid the, could avoid that, you know, that fear that people have. Um, furthermore, it, it, it really, we have to be able to um, protect the renters that need the most protection while also um, growing our housing supply. Those two things have to come hand in hand. And I think the opposition tried to force us to choose between racial equity and economic growth. And that's a, that's a false choice, right? We don't have to make that choice. We can have both. Um, also, our ordinance doesn't actually prevent where rent can be initially set. So if a developer is trying to build something in St. Paul and they're like, okay, I need, I need rents to be set here, 
to make my pro forma work out. Um, we do not touch the initial rent, right? That can be set wherever it's needed. We're just saying that after initial rent has been set, it should not, um, it should not grow more than 3% a year. And that 3% is based on research of our history of rent increases in the Twin Cities, which for the past 20 years have been at or below 3%. Um, and of course, we have an exemption um, process as well for folks who need it. But we know that a lot of the flaws in other cities' rent stabilization policies are that when you create too many exemptions, where that's, whether that's an exemption in new construction or an exemption in you know, certain buildings, you create dual housing markets where some people are protected and others aren't. And when there are dual housing markets, there are really um, bad incentives um, that come out of those dual markets. Let me, maybe just one more, this is kind of a technical question, uh, but we'll maybe finish up with this one. What if a rent is X, a downturn hits, an economic downturn, and rents are lowered by, you know, 30% or so. Um, and then the, the economy rebounds, are landlords then limited to 3% increases moving forward? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think most renters will say, I've never seen my rent go down even when the economy is bad. So that's very much a theoretical, right? I can't, I don't remember a time that my rent has ever gone down even if there's a recession. Um, but to, you know, let's walk through the scenario. If that really did happen, um, the landlord could um, request an exemption from the city. And one of the factors could be, well, I haven't increased my rent at all in the past 20 years, you know, what about now? And that's something that the city will have to consider. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing this, Tom and, and Eric. Really appreciate you joining the call and, and you, you, you provide a really great example of how grassroots advocacy can work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so we have reached the end of our agenda. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time back. I just wanna thank everyone for participating, especially our panelists who are phenomenal. Uh, and urge everyone to please take the time now, mobilize your networks, get them contacting your members of Congress. You do it too. Uh, let's make sure the Build Back Better Act gets passed and that the critical housing components that are in, uh, that the, are the priorities of the House campaign are part of that package when it does get passed. Please, please reach out to your members of Congress and, and urge action this week. Thank you all very much, and we will see you again next week. Take care, everybody.